But uh, last October, after many years now working as a, a, a minor Palestinian activist, just trying to be a mother and give some support, because once you've lived amongst the poorest people in the world, and once you've experienced their smiles and their hopes, and you've had them cry for your misery, you can't just walk away. So I went to uh, Qom in Iran last uh, October. I was there working. I was in Tehran reporting on the Al-Quds Day march. And I had one day off. And a colleague of mine said, you really should come to Qom, to the shrine of uh, Bibi Fatima. And uh, I want you to see it. And I went into the mosque and I, I did wudu, because I knew how to do it, having lived in, uh, in Gaza for a while. <clears throat> and uh, I went up to the shrine and I just watched the other women, what they were doing. And they all seemed to touch the shrine and then pray to Allah. So I stood there and I just said, Dear Allah, thank you very much for this journey that I'm on. I have nothing to ask because you've given me everything. Please bless Palestine. And then I sat down on, on the floor. And it was very busy. It was a Tuesday night, which is pilgrims' night. So, you know, there were children doing cartwheels and women breaking their fast on the floor. It wasn't quiet. But the second I sat down, I was somewhere else. Somewhere I'd never been before in my life. A realm of such absolute peace and tranquility and joy that I knew that above a certain point in our universe, everything's okay. That none of these worries, the things that we have going on in our heads, they don't matter at all. Because above a certain point, everything is okay. There's joy and tranquility. I sat there for a long time and a young woman came over to me. I was in a shador, so you could only see my face. I was very curled up. And she sat opposite me and she held my hands and she looked into my eyes and she said, I love you. I love you. I'd never seen her before. I just felt at that moment that she was my sister and my daughter and I was her aunt and her grandmother. I can't really explain the love that went between us, but it was something almost fierce. And then she backed away from me and she went. And I understood the love that is the Ummah. And they did what eight and ten year olds do. They went to their bedroom and made a list of questions. And then they came up to me and they said, mm -hmm, here are the questions. When you're a Muslim, will you still be mummy? That was question one. And I said, yes, when I'm a Muslim, I will still be mummy. In fact, I suspect I will be an even better mummy. And they gave a little tick. And they said, question number two, will you smoke when you're a Muslim? I had to think about that one because I know a lot of Muslim people smoke. But I thought, this is such a big change. Why not go for the whole thing? Really cleanse yourself out as you're cleansing your spiritual being out. So I said, I won't smoke. And they said, great. And the third question was, when you're a Muslim, will you drink alcohol? And I said, when I'm a Muslim, I will never drink alcohol again. <laughs> to which my daughters replied rather worryingly, hooray, make of that what you will. And the final question, just to show you how pure children are, is this. When you're a Muslim, will you wear low-cut tops? I said, what have they been hearing at school about Islam? I said, no, no, when I'm a Muslim, I will always have this area of my body covered up. And they said, we love Islam. <laughs> My mother was slightly more difficult to uh, persuade. Um, I told her about the experience at Qum, and she was crying. And she said, that's beautiful to have a spiritual experience with God. You know, that's amazing. And the next week I saw her, and I had a scarf on. And she said, what have you got that on your head for? And I said, well, remember that conversation we had, Mum? I'm a Muslim. And she went very dangerously quiet. And she looked at me and went, Muslim. Muslim. I thought you said Buddhist. <laughs> Muslim. What those 